Okay, so the title actually changed uh, because I asked all the speakers to uh, emphasize depth over breadth. So I'm going to focus on superconductivity in graphene. And this is inspired uh, by the fact that Andrea Young was gracious enough to send me a copy of his paper, this new discovery that he announced in this conference, uh, coordinating it with his archive, post, archive posting. So I thought I will discuss superconductivity in graphene. Uh, by graphene, I obviously mean um, the development of the last two, three years. So. Uh, uh, and you know, I'll speculate and I'll also show results, uh, some published, some unpublished. And this way we have at least a, a single story. Uh, the story will be coherent and comprehensive, but it's probably not complete. So, uh, you know, uh, these are the uh, people that I count on for doing the work. And Yangzi in particular has done an enormous amount of work for the last like 56 hours. I bothered him continuously and he, uh, tirelessly produce results. So what I'll discuss is what is the mechanism and symmetry of the superconductivity? And uh, if uh, we have control over that, I should be able to tell you something about what the uh, superconducting transition temperature is. And of course, the by mechanism, I mean electron phonon or electron spin fluctuation, electron electron, or perhaps something that we do not even know about. Well, I can't imagine anything outside these three. Uh, electron paramagnet is also really a part of electron electron, but typically one separates that out because you have some spin physics coming in. So these are the famous experimental uh, results, the original results from, can you all see my arrow? Um, um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. so this is you know, Pablo's original result, Carl et al, the famous paper that started it all. And here is the superconducting domes. Uh, this is the Santa Barbara Columbia collaboration that uh, reproduced the basic physics. And here is the superconducting phase here. Uh, not that strong um, insulating phase, but the superconductor is very clear. This is the beautiful data from Barcelona where you see superconductor is everywhere. It looks like it will be superconductor everywhere, uh, except it's preempted by these insulating phases. And so the first question one asks as a theorist, as a physicist is, can this superconductor be, to be totally different? Because after all, all these insulating phases are mod type strong correlation physics, mod Hubbard type physics. Uh, and that's true in the transition metal diagonal generators also, because what you are doing by having a more system is increasing the ratio of interaction to uh, kinetic energy because you are strongly suppressing kinetic energy by having large unit cell, hopping is going down. So you expect mod Hubbard type physics to come in. You expect insulating phases at various commensurate filling, but what about superconductivity? So that's the first question we asked also. We all want exotic superconductivity, electron electron interaction induced superconductivity. And so uh, we did some very large uh, renormalization group calculations. This is work of uh, uh, Robert Throckmorton in Maryland. What we did, because to do large scale RG, you need some symmetry. So what we did is we took a honeycomb lattice uh, and applied a periodic potential to it. So instead of taking, you know, really the Moira structure where the symmetries are not really completely known, uh, actually it's not symmetric, okay? Pure Moira is completely quasi-periodic. It's not symmetric. We assume it to be symmetric. We cut things off. So we did something slightly easier. We applied a periodic potential to a honeycomb lattice and, uh, and used a contact potential and did Wilsonian uh, momentum shell RG at finite temperature and finite chemical potential, which is not done often. And then asked, are there instabilities? And just to emphasize how difficult this calculation is, it took Robert Throckmorton a very long time, close to a year to do it. Without any symmetry, you have 34 parameter RG. Then with various symmetries, uh, like the D3 symmetry is always there, you can bring it down to 10 parameter RG. And, uh, and uh, Robert went ahead and did that. And I'm going to descri describe these results in great details. Uh, we looked at both particle hole, which is the non-superconducting channel, order parameter and fixed points, and obtained the leading instabilities from a contact interaction. 
on the electron the contact electron electron interaction is the only interaction we have in this theory and we find all kinds of order you know one could even say any order you could imagine uh, all the symmetries of the system can be broken spontaneously and we found ferromagnetic quantum spin hall loop spin current spin pneumatic kekule kekule spin current spin density wave uh, various kind of charge all of them show up uh, in the particle hole channel. And then when you go to particle particle channel, we find again, many different types of superconductivity, you know, including pair density wave and so on. So yes, you know, it's not surprising that if you allow all symmetries and allow your RG flow, you'll find superconductivity. But is this what is seen? Uh, here is another paper which is done by Yiting Shu, who used to be at Maryland, uh, but is now a, as a faculty member at Notre Dame, and Feng Cheng Wu, who used to be here and now at Wuhan University. This is uh, the last one was for a single mon uh, bilayer. You know, that was for twisted bilayer graphene. This, uh, this is for twisted double bilayer graphene. So the symmetries are somewhat different. And now, you, you know, we look at both intra-valley and inter-valley possibilities. Again, I'm not going to discuss it in great details. We allow particle hole nesting, and there are various interaction parameters you can vary. This is the parameter gamma three you're varying, and you find some superconducting phase P and D here. You also find P superconductivity, D superconductivity here. You find ferromagnetic phase. So the, the, the bottom line is that if you do a coupling perturbative renormalization group, then preserving all the symmetries, you do find uh, superconductivity, okay? And this is not just our results, others have found it too. So yes, indeed, electron-electron interaction could lead to superconductivity in this system, superconductivity of various complicated symmetries. Now, let me go back, before I comment further, let me go back to the original, some original papers, two of them mine, and then, of course, the famous paper by, by Bitcher and McDonald, I'll come to that. So, you know, in, this is a long time ago, 2007. Uh, we wrote a paper, it's mainly Konjung Wu's work. This is when Konjung Wu was a postdoc at KITP. Uh, and, and we took a honeycomb lattice and we said, what if a honeycomb lattice was completely flat? What would happen? And it turns out that we could solve the problem exactly. And, and we are not imaginative enough. All we could say it will have ignor crystallization. So, we say here, you can see, most intriguing is the possibility of exotic incompressible states, Laughlin liquid, fractional quantum Hall state, and Wigner crystal. This paper, which is uh, you know, flat bands by having various kind of uh, symmetries in your, in your two-dimensional bands with also non-trivial churn numbers, which we said can be made in ultra atomic gases. We also talked about insulators through various spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay? Let's see what McDonald and Bistrisa talked about. This is a very famous paper, right? More bands in twisted double layer graphene. So this is the last sentence in their paper. Finally, we remark that electron-electron interactions neglected in this work are certain to be important at magic twist angles in neutral systems and could give rise to counterflow superfluidity, flat band magnetism, other types of water states. What is the common feature here? All these papers are imagining all kinds of interesting symmetry breakings and interesting new exotic phases, but none of them predict superconductivity because there's no, no reason to predict superconductivity. When you create flat band and an electron electron interaction, you expect magnetism, you expect Mott insulator, you expect Wigner crystallization. If it's a bilayer, you expect excitonic superfluidity, but you don't expect superconductivity. So you didn't predict superconductivity. And so that's why, to me at least, the fact that Pablo saw superconductivity in, in that experiment came, was a very exciting thing, okay? So I want to emphasize that, uh, that you know, you do not associate superconductivity essentially with flat bands, okay? But RG will give you superconductivity. So let's see, are there concrete established examples of repulsive electron electron interaction in the superconductivity? I mean, you know, it's a, it's a question without the leading answer, no. Okay, so they, we don't only one example, conducting just superconductivity, uh, which always happens if you let the system flow. It uh, really is a fixed point, but the TC is very, very low. 
Okay, we understand everything about it. For example, in regular metallic system, you get that and this is very low, you know, of this order, 10 to the minus 40 Kelvin, and usually you get some higher orbital uh, superconductivity in a high orbital pairing. And this is of no relevance anywhere. Well, this is in uh, Coulomb interacting system in the continuum. That's what what our Kohn and Lattinger worked on. Uh, and there, this has no experimental relevance. It's, you know, it's something we want to talk about, but it really has no experimental. Well, as far as I know, there is no strong coupling in LF1 Lattinger superconductivity. I'm no expert on it, but I communicated with the experts before I made this statement. You know, I communicated with Andre Chibukov, Steve Kibelson, and the Milles. And basically the conclusion is that no one has been, people looked very hard, you know, and flat iron, they have a whole center looking for superconductivity in the Hubbard model. And they have not found any strong coupling in LF1 Lattinger superconductivity. Minimal Hubbard model does not manifest any strong coupling superconductivity. It does manifest weak coupling superconductivity and uh, Andre alluded to it. This is the paper by Chubukov and, and Kibelson and Steve has other papers, uh, but these are all I'd call a Kron Lattinger type superconductivity. You know, we can argue on the nomenclature, but it's very similar physics and TC is typically low. May not be 10 to the minus 40 Kelvin, maybe micro Kelvin, not of relevance to the systems you're talking about. And all the RG calculations I was telling you, this is the kind of superconductivity you are getting. You know, you cannot really calculate TC in RG, but the, what you are getting, if it's repulsive interaction, is some very low TC superconductivity. Of course, if you make the uh, Coulomb in, electron electron interaction attractive in RG, you have both sides, then of course you are going to get superconductivity. But that's, you know, attractive electron electron interaction does not exist unless you invoke something else, some other mechanism. So I set up this whole thing, and we actually have done a lot of work on, on, on RG. And my conclusion is electron-electron interaction is not the superconducting mechanism in more systems. It could give you superconductivity, but very low temperature superconductivity. I cannot say it's not impossible, because you cannot say something does not happen. But I do not think there is only any theoretical calculation that shows that you can have a strong coupling superconductivity in these systems arising from electron inter interaction. Again, I want to be careful in what I'm saying. I'm saying I don't know of any example. Obviously, I cannot rule it out based on our calculations, okay? So the most obvious candidate mechanism for superconductivity is always the electron phonon interaction. Why? Why do I say that? Uh, it's not like I like phonons, you know. Most of my papers are on electron electron interaction. Well, the reason is very simple. Essentially, all known superconductors are phonon mediated. You know, I do not know the number because what? There are like 50,000 superconductors, maybe 100,000. I think it's a safe assumption that 99.9% .9 are known to be phonon mediated. Not like there is no question, okay? There are some exceptions, you know, like some heavy fermion materials, perhaps benictides, but these are rare. You know, famous example is superfluidine in helium-3, but that's not electrons, that's totally different materials, okay? They are definitely, it's not phonons, it's some other. Now, graphene, of course, electron phonon interaction is very weak and you can calculate what kind of TC it will give. It will be way below one millikelvin. You know, we did that some years ago, I'll talk about it. So that's the mystery. This is the mystery uh, the MIT experiment, Carvital Pablo's famous experiment brought in. This is why many of us thought that maybe electron electron interaction which is very strongly enhanced in this system because a flat band is not only causing the insulating states, but also the superconducting states because graphene electron phonon interaction is weak. But you know, it was already known that if you can dope graphene to its van of singularity, regular graphene, which is almost impossible to do, you need very high density, then maybe you will see superconductivity. I mean, that actually never happened, so you don't know. The thing that I realized was that in Morris system, there is a different physics, nothing to do with electron electron interaction. The same flat band that causes very strong electron electron interaction also re reduces the Fermi velocity. In fact, if the band is completely flat at the magic angle, Fermi velocity goes to zero. That's why it's called flat band. And this, of course, effectively increases the electron phonon coupling by the same ratio. So if the Fermi velocity is suppressed by a factor of 100, your effective electron phonon coupling is going up by a factor of 100. So in magic angle twisted graphene, 
electron phonon interaction uh, may be strongly enhanced. So this may lead to a superconducting TC of the order of Kelvin. You know, here it's one millikelvin, but since this goes into an exponential, maybe it brings it up to one Kelvin. This is possible, and you have to check that. And uh, as I would show you that the symmetry of the system, because it has valley, sublattice, and spin, allow phonons to give rise to higher order symmetry. You know, normally you expect phonons to give you S wave superconductor, you know, P and D wave will be very, very low TC. But here that's not true. I'm going to show you, and we already do some papers on that. So phonons are therefore the leading superconducting candidates, even in this system. And phonons must be ruled out before you talk about anything else. This, this was my viewpoint, and this is still my viewpoint. So my guess, I'll, you know, I'll put my money where my mouth is. My guess is that uh, it's the 90% probability is that the electron phonon interaction is causing superconductivity in all these systems, 9% probability electron paramagnon and 1% everything else. 1% is not a very small number, so I cannot rule this out. Okay, so uh, if you do not believe all these theoretical arguments, here is some experimental argument, direct experimental argument showing that perhaps Coulomb interaction is not the cause for superconductivity. Here are two papers uh, in this, First paper, Stepanov et al., this is from Barcelona. What they did, they put a metallic gate very close to the system, just seven nanometer. Well, if the super, so metallic gate is screening the system and they, if, if your superconductivity was caused by electron electron interaction, the idea was superconductivity will go away. Superconductivity did not go away, it remained strong. And what went away are the insulating phases. We, of course, know the insulating phases uh, arise from electron electron interaction. You see, they are not there here. But when they put the metallic gate a bit farther away, twice the distance, superconductivity remains the same, but now you str see strong insulating states. So when you look at the difference between these two, strong screening, insulating state gone, weak screening, insulating state are there, superconductivity remains unchanged. This kind of is in a strong circumstantial evidence that electron electron interaction is not the cause for superconductivity. Here is an experiment from Santa Barbara and we are Young's group with very similar physics. Their case, they did not put a gate, they put different thicknesses of the boron nitride layer. So, but the same physics, since the graphite gate is at the end of the boron nitride, you can think the gate is 38 nanometer away here. 7.5 nanometer here. Superconducting phase is more or less equally strong in both, but when the gate is seven nanometer, the insulating states all disappear. You just have superconductivity, you have nothing else because all the correlated insulating phases, which obviously arise from electron electron interaction, that's Mott, Hubbard, Wigner physics, uh, they go away, but supercon does not go away. So I would say this is pretty strong circumstantial evidence that electron electron interaction is not causing superconductivity. I gave you a bunch of theoretical arguments before. Now I'm giving you some direct experimental argument. Okay? So this does not mean superconductivity rising from phonons, but this does mean you have to take the possibility very seriously. Okay? And uh, you know, it also shows that superconductivity is unlikely. That's the strongest statement I'll make to be arising from Coulomb coupling. So let's now try to understand uh, phonons scattering a little better in this uh, graphene system. So Yu Hian Wang and I actually did the first phonon calculation. This is a long time ago, you know, 11, 12 years ago. We calculated acoustic phonon scattering limited carrier mobility resistivity in graphene, monolayer graphene. And we extracted an effective electron phonon coupling, which was very weak, 0 0.01. And uh, after a couple of years after our work, Efetov, this is the same Efetov who is now doing uh, more experiment, beautiful experiment, Barcelona. He was a Philip student at Columbia. Um, and this was his thesis. He actually did a measurement of electron phonon resistivity and found this lambda to be 0 0.01. And in fact, topological insulator surface, which is very much like graphene, I'm not gonna talk about it, Chizy Lee. Uh, we did a calculation modifying this and we found lambda is 0.1 here. So he predicted that perhaps surfaces of uh, two-dimensional metallic surfaces of uh, topological insulators may go superconducting just by virtue of 
electron phonon interaction, you know, uh, transition temperature below a Kelvin. I really do not know the status of this, if anybody has looked for it or anything. Okay? Uh, so let me first show you our, this is my calculation with Huang. We calculate the resistivity. So this is the block Gunaizen reg regime where the phonons are suppressed and resistivity is falling off as to the power four. And this is the, you know, the, the equipartition regime where the resistivity is linear in T and they're separated by this block Gunaizen temperature, which is of the order of 100 Kelvin in, in for these densities. And you can write down analytically the linear regime, the resistivity, and this is the, this is the famous VF. It depends on one over VF square, the resistivity, okay? So, and you can extract a lambda just from these formulas, okay? The details are not very important. You can look at the paper. This is very standard physics, but you did it accurately, accurately uh, without waving our hands. You know, we actually calculated the resistivity, okay? It remained like that, nobody paid any attention, but then, Efetov and Kim did the measurement. And I don't want to brag too much because the experimentalist put our theoretical plots on it and experiment and theory agree quantitatively, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, and you can see the resistivity is changing very little, okay? It's less than one ohm per Kelvin. It's more like 0.1 ohm per Kelvin. So it's, a, it's the first time block Gunaizen behavior, this high power law, for phonon scattering was seen because of the very pure samples. So what we predicted was seen exactly as we predicted and all the numbers agreed, okay? But lambda is very small. Lambda is 0 0.01 then, you know, in units of 10 to the 12 per square centimeter density and unit of this 10 to the 6 centimeter per second ratio. So if you take this lambda and put it in a BCS formula, you'll basically conclude that TC is very, very small, you know, less than one mini Kelvin. So there is no superconductivity because electron phonon coupling is weak in, in graphene. But in, when you go to twisted binary graphene, what I realized when Andrea Young contacted me, uh, I think it was in 2018, saying that he's finding he had this paper and he noticed that his resistivity was much, much higher, like 10 kel ohm per Kelvin or 100 ohm per Kelvin. And he asked me and I said, oh, it's because of this physics that the bands are flat. Here is how the Fermi velocity changes with twist angle. And he's saying, as you can see, with twist angle, the Fermi velocity could be, you know, factor of 100 lower than, easily factor of 10, but factor of 100 lower. So now, if you look at this formula, resistivity will go up by 10 to the power 4 if you really reduce velocity by factor of 100. So, you know, my, my immediate reaction was that's what is being seen in, this, in these experiments. And so let's see if that happens. So we uh, wrote a paper, basically redoing the calculation for putting in the twisted bilayer graphene, the Bistis or McDonald band structure, putting in that band structure, and we found that if the angle is large, you basically recover what we got, you know, ten years ago. But when the angle is small, resistivity goes up enormously because effective electron phonon coupling is going up through this reduction of Fermi velocity. So resistivity now will be, the slope will be much, much larger. So we, we, we predicted that in regular graphene, D rho DT is just 0.1 ohm per Kelvin, but in twisted bilayer graphene close to magic angle, it could be as large as 100 ohm per Kelvin or even larger, okay? This is larger than in you know, strongly correlated oxides and the linearity will, could, could go all the way down to 10 Kelvin at low, lower density. So the lambda increases to one almost, and this implies, according to the BCS theory, TC of the order of one Kelvin. Okay. So this data actually existed. Pablo already had data, beautiful data, in fact. I mean, you know, some of the most spectacular resistive versus temperature data I've ever seen in my life. This is sample MA4, very famous sample. I spent a lot of time on MA4. And for you know different densities, this is for two different densities, different densities, and you see what's going on. Resistivity at high temperature is completely linear. All kinds of complicated things happen at low temperature. Okay, it goes resistive, it goes insulating, it goes superconducting. But look at this region. Slope is density independent, constant slope, very high slope, 
And if you extract this slope, you get some value of the resistivity, which, you know, this is our theoretical plots, very close to our theory, okay? D rho DT, I mean, when I say very close, you know, in this business, nobody puts experimental data. I mean, if you talk about spin liquids or electron electron interaction or something exotic, nobody demands that you get any agreement with experiment. You just have to claim that I have a spin liquid. Unfortunately, when you talk about electron phonon interaction, all the referees want agreement better than a factor of two, which is not possible because people don't realize that this deformation potential coupling is not known very well, even in a material like gallium arsenide. It's not an easy thing to measure experimentally. So it's always a factor of two or so uh, uh, uncertainty deformation potential. Since resistivity goes as d squared, factor of two here is factor of four. So you don't really, you're not going to get better than factor of four or five agreement. So, but we got pretty good agreement with the state, linear resistivity, but it's not perfect. Particularly, let me just emphasize, this is not a story I want to discuss. Over here, there are questions about agreement between theory and experiment, but that's not the topic of today. Topic of today is, uh, can electron phonon interaction give rise to superconductivity? Here are data from, from uh, Columbia Santa Barbara collaboration, Andrea and Corey, and the same story, resistivity is linear, and this linearity again agrees. Oh, you may wonder what's happening here. This is completely well understood. Is thermal occupancy is higher bands. Basically, you're taking reducing electron density. So you have to just look at this region. This region is, is band structure. Okay. So if you see this part, again, theory and experiment agree well. So let me just show you the comparison of theory and experiment. So these are the actual experimental points. These are the theory. The theory doesn't really apply in this region because the velocity of the phonon is larger than the velocity of the fermions. And you know, agreement, it's, it's, if, we, if we just change the deformation potential coupling by a factor of two, we get pretty good agreement, okay? So good qualitative agreement, I would say good semi-quantitative agreement, good quantitative agreement if we adjust deformation potential coupling divided by phonon velocity, acoustic phonon velocity, sound velocity by a factor of two, uh, you know, this is the best one can do. Even gallium arsenide the agreement between phonons and, and transport is of the same order. But the important point is that this enhanced lambda. Well, if it enhanced lambda, uh, uh, now this is, uh, this is an experiment. In fact, I should talk about this. This is an experimental paper that just posted in April from China. They looked at twisted double bilayer graphene, where also we did a theory for what the transport would look like. Uh, this is the paper where we did a theory, same theory of phonons in twisted double bilayer graphene. Here, the difference is that the slope is not linear. The slope is linear, but it depends on density now. Okay, it depends on a form factor. So the slope is not constant at all density. So this is our, how the slope varies the function of density using the band structure of twisted double bilayer graphene at various angles. And this, experiment does careful measurement of the resistivity in twisted double bilayer graphene. I have not absorbed all parts of it, but the conclusion is that it agrees pretty well with our theoretical prediction, okay? So in twisted double bilayer graphene, the linear resistivity coefficient depends on carrier density and theory and experiments seem to agree according to this paper. And you really have to look into this paper to see to what extent theory and experiment agree, but that's the conclusion of this paper, okay? They did not see superconductivity though. Okay, so here, this is the conclusion of the paper that T linear resistance can be well accounted for by acoustic phonon scattering, and we name it conventional metal. All right, so what about superconductivity now? So this is, you can say, the beginning of the main talk. Well, you can use the simple uh, BCS theory. In normal BCS theory that you read in textbooks, this is theta Debye, but when uh, Fermi energy is lower than theta Debye, then the actual energy is the, is the energy scale for the electron, the energy scale of the phonon. This is very easy to show from BCS theory. So KBTC is given by this formula, lambda BCS of order one, I told you. So if you just take the lambda that we obtained from the transport measurements or the transport theory, they agree, you immediately get a TC of one Kelvin. So this is at least consistent with the observations in the twisted bilayer graphene. But the really important thing that was somehow overlooked is that 
for acoustic phonons now or for optical phonons also, because the system has valleys and sublattices and spin, you have many more quantum numbers, you can pair the electrons, Cooper pairing can happen in a variety of different ways of now. You can, you, know, you can pair them between valleys, you can pair them between sublattices, and then you work all of these things out when you do the group theory correctly, as Feng Cheng did, and you do a paper on it, you find out that actually all kinds of unconventional pairing comes out of electron phonon interaction. You do not need any exotic mechanism to get exotic pairing. In fact, you can have S wave pairing, you can have F wave pairing, you can also have D wave pairing and P wave pairing. So all the pairings that one talks about, you can get simply out of acoustic phonons and optical phonons also, but I'll talk about acoustic phonons. I don't think optical phonons play any role in, in the superconductivity here. Uh, so the point is that you cannot say, well, I just triple superconductivity, so phonons are ruled out. In fact, in the paper that we wrote, where we solved the BCS theory, you know, doing the Lierberg theory, and you get a formula like this. What we find is that for acoustic phonon, all these are not only allowed, S and F are really the most likely ones, and they are degenerate. Okay, so phonon in this triple superconducting pairing was actually predicted in this paper, and you can then solve the gap equation. Uh, using electron phonon interaction. And this is a paper I'm telling you, uh, as mentioning. Uh, if you look at this paper, you will find that uh, this figure, in this figure, what we show is that acoustic phonon interaction no, it gives you a very large TC and S wave pairing and F wave pairing are actually degenerate. Both of them to get, both of them give you this TC. And P and D are also degenerate, but they give you much lower TC. Of course, this symmetry may be broken. For example, if you have any spin, spin fluctuations, it will be broken and F will become more likely. Okay. So electron phonon interactions mediate attractions in SPDF pairing channels. Attractions are strongly enhanced by flat bands near the magic angle. And in fact, F wave pairing is very, very likely. If you solve the gap equation correctly using the actual symmetry of the system. Okay, so phonons lead to TC of one Kelvin and phonons may lead to triplet superconductivity. S and F are degenerate, but F is more stable than P. Okay, now we got very uh, inspired by Pablo's recent experiment that he talked about today, where he looked at magic angle twisted trilayer graphene and he found possible spin triplet superconductivity. He talked about it today. And the main evidence is that he applies a large in-plane field beyond the Clarkson limit. And he finds that there is superconductivity and maybe superconductivity is even slightly enhanced. So it could be this FOF superconductivity that I just mentioned. But we looked at a different possibility. You saw this figure, Pablo showed it today. I'm not gonna discuss it, very complicated, but here is all the superconductivity. And, and the question is that, could it, be, uh, could it be triplet superconductivity arising from some other mechanism? And here, we want to discuss a mechanism which is not phonon. I already argued in favor of phonon, but let's see, since a spin triplet, first thing that comes up in your mind is spin fluctuations. So can spin fluctuations give rise to triplet superconductivity here? So what we did, and this is in this paper, very recent paper, Yang Zi Chao's work, that uh, we start with a spin unpolarized normal state, but assume that spin fluctuation is very strong because of electron correlation. And then we use a phenomenological spin Fermion model which has been used extensively in the, in the context of pinnictide superconductors. So what you do in this spin fermion model that you assume your fermions and electrons are coupled to spin fluctuations. So the state cannot be ferromagnetic because if the state is ferromagnetic, you have no spin fluctuations. You need paramagnons, not magnons. So in a ferromagnetic state, this would not give you any superconductivity. And then you can do a BCS type theory using this electron paramagnon coupling within a spin fermion model. The model is phenomenological because you do not know where the spin fluctuations coming from, but we assume they're there. 
And then you can integrate out the fluctuating spin field. And then you get a spin triplet pairing because now the spin fluctuations are the bosons that are the glue giving you the Cooper pairing. And we can go through exactly the same argument Feng Cheng did for the phonons. And in fact, Feng Cheng is a co-author in this paper. And we showed that you can have definitely intervalley pairing or intravalley pairing. And F wave is the intra sub lattice intervalley pairing. Okay. So you get the F wave pairing here also. Okay. Spin triplet F wave pairing. Uh, and, and we can do the full calculation within this model. There's no problem once the model is defined. And we find that F wave pairing dominates over P wave, exactly as we found for phonons. And it's true for other systems also. And we can calculate the free energy, and that tells us that F wave dominates over P wave. Okay, the details are in this paper in the supplementary material. So we concluded that uh, what they are observing at MIT is consistent with phonons, F wave phonon, like I told you, but it's also consistent with spin fluctuation mediated superconductivity if there are a lot of spin fluctuations in the MIT sample. Uh, it's fully gap, it's topologically trivial, and it's unitary. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's an equal spin pairing. So, so ferromagnetic system would not have it. Now we come to the experiment that Andrea, hey, how am I doing with time? How, how much time do I have? I think you still have like about half an hour. Oh, I have half an hour now. I'm, I've been rushing. Okay. All right, so there'll be a lot of time for uh, question then. Very good. So now I come to the experiment that Andrea Young presented. You know, he was gracious enough to make his big discovery announcement in the conference, and I'm very grateful for him for arranging that. Uh, so this is now no more physics at all. Regular no twist trilayer graphene, ABC graphene. And this band structure is highly tunable by displacement field, okay? Now, Andre had an earlier experiment that he talked about that this system, because this, there are Van Hoop singularities, he saw a stoner instability. So there's a flavor polarization. In this particular case, a flavor here is regular spin, but it doesn't have to be regular spin. It could be valid also. So these spin polarized states are confirmed experimentally in the Van Hoop singularity. Now, as Andrea, said in his talk, if you have a van of singularity, you have a density of states peak. Density of states peak gives you stonar ferromagnetism. It gives you an instability, but it also gives you superconductivity. Okay, so can that happen here? So large density of state may allow for superconductivity even without more. Do the numbers work out? That's the question. Now, uh, I have to thank Andrea again, because he sent me the paper that I think is coming out tonight, uh, uh, two and a half days ago, you know, almost three days ago, and Yang Zi Chao and I uh, basically didn't sleep for this 56 hours, uh, producing results. So you will see results which compare with the experimental results Andrea showed today, okay, for electron phonon coupling. So now I'm gonna switch gear, now, I already showed you that if we do, this, do a spin fermion calculation, we will get the superconductivity Andrea is getting because it's the same system, you know, it's the same physics that I just showed for the MIT sample. But now there is the more physics, so let's see what happens with the conformal interaction. So this is what Andrea showed us today. This is from his uh, the, the stoner instability uh, figure, uh, this paper, and you can see the stoner instability near the Van of singularity peak. Okay. So what we want to do now, we want to say, okay, this is the density of states, the single particle band structure density of states in this system. So you see the Van Hoek peaks. And uh, uh, so uh, these are the, we, you know, you can displace it by applying a displacement field. So this is no displacement field. This is some finite displacement field. Let's put both of them together. These are the Van Hoek peak. This is the density of states. We, this is the kind of density of states obtained from the actual band structure. Uh, it's an old calculation of Alan McDonald's from uh, almost 10 years ago, which is what you're using for all the results I'm going to show you. So our, our electrons are described by the 
actual band structure, this band structure. Okay. Now we want to do a BCS theory to see whether this sort of band structure, this sort of density of state peak allows for superconductivity in the non-more regular ABC trilayer graphene. Okay. So the coupling is the standard BCS coupling. Here is our electron phonon coupling constant, deformation potential coupling. And fortunately it's known for this ABC graphene. This is the number. There is no more physics here at all. This G0 is just depends on phonon parameters. And we took it from the literature. Okay. So this is the ABC graphene electron phonon coupling. Then the Hamiltonian then is known. This G, you take matrix element in the basis that of this band structure. Okay. So there are some one year functions that come in that define this G K K prime. So this is now an exact numerical BCS theory calculation. So we can write down the linearized band equation with the standard self-consistent equation, delta given by an integral over delta, where this chi is the propagator, this propagator. Okay. And this G, all the physics is coming to this G, which is calculated according to the ABC rhombohedral graphene band structure. No Moira physics at all. And G has the ABC graphene electron phonon coupling, acoustic, acoustic phonon coupling matrix element. So this can be solved. And let me first tell you the results we get. I already told you that we'll find because the symmetries are the same. We still have valleys and sublattice and spin. We find S wave spin signal and F wave spin triplet are degenerate. Uh, if you had you know, some kind of normal state, it, so no, no ferromagnetism, okay? Meaning non-ferromagnetic normal state. This should say non-ferromagnetic, in fact. So you have equal spin pair pairing, then F wave will be favored, okay? Uh, uh, if superconductivity exists, then, so if the superconductivity exists with ferromagnetism, then it must be phonons because you do not have any spin fluctuations with, with in a ferromagnetic state, okay? So if Andrea Young reported today, this morning, that he saw superconductivity coexist with ferromagnetism, then you could definitely say that this is phonons because then there is no, but, but that's not what he finds. He actually finds superconductivity very close to the ferromagnetic phase, but they don't coexist, at least not so far. If they don't coexist, we cannot rule out the possibility that the glue is paramagnum, okay? Spin fluctuations. I do not think that's what it is. You will see why in a few minutes, but purely theoretically, both possibilities exist now because both will give you triplet superconductivity uh, with phonon coupling or paramagnet coupling, and both could be close to the ferromagnetic phase because not because of ferromagnetism for phonons, but because this van of singularity is enhancing the BCSTC. Well, without any more uh, uh, you know suspense, let me show you a calculated. Uh, Yang Zichou, this is all calculation over the last 56 hours, okay? This is the density of states I showed you. And this is the calculated TC where this equation is solved for electron phonon coupling as I explained to you, okay? And so this is for uh, two different displacement field and, and, and Yang Zichou actually did the calculation. No, this is for two different grids, sorry, not two different, two, two different grids. Yang Zhi was very careful solving this integral equation using different grids, making sure that we are not fooling ourselves. Uh, uh, you know, and, and you see that TC is peaked around the Van Ho peak. But the important thing is that, that TC is finite even far from the Van Ho peak. You know, even over here, at least in this BCS3, TC is of the order of one Kelvin. Okay. So over here is three Kelvin, it's three times less, but it's not. It, it's not vanishing. And, and the reason is it's not just the VHS peak that determines the TC. When you look at the structure of this 
integral equation, uh, having a peak is important, but what is more important is the total area under the peak. And so total area, so the, the, it's you know, a bit further away. I mean, this is the calculation. I don't have to put words on it. You can see this is finite, a bit further away. So if you have ferromagnetism here, and this ferromagnetism is destroying superconductivity here, you'll still have superconductivity over here. And, and, and this may very well be what's going on in the experiment. I cannot say this is what is going on. That's a far too strong a statement, and I'm not betting that. But I'm making the statement that this may be what is going on, and I personally think this is what is going on. So phonons can induce uh, a TC of the order of one Kelvin, as you can see, TC of the order of one Kelvin. In ABC trilayer graphene, no twist physics, no Moire unit cell, and both S and F are allowed. So just by from this, we cannot say whether it's S or F. Okay, single and triple and degenerate, unless you invoke some spin fluctuations or something. Okay, and, and so it's very important in both MIT experiment and Santa Barbara experiment to figure out what the symmetry is from a direct symmetry measurement. So over here. You know, so if I now try to get agreement with the facts Andrea supplied in his talk today, then over here is probably S wave because it's far enough from the ferromagnetic state. But if you saw it, you know, lying with ferromagnetism, uh, uh, it, it, it definitely will then be an F wave superconductor. But over here, I would say it's more likely that's S wave, but I cannot rule out F wave, okay? And so our current picture, and this is very tentative, we're writing a paper, but this is really thinking over the last 56 hours. So I reserve the right to change this story completely. So our current picture is the phase that Andrea called today SC1, and I think that's how it's showing up in his archive posting tonight, is an S wave superconductor. And the phase is calling SC2 is an F wave superconductor. Why? Because this SC2 happens very close to the ferromagnetic phase. So he has strong spin fluctuations there, which will then favor F wave. This is happening far from the ferromagnetic phase, no spin fluctuations. So S wave probably would be preferred here. But it's certainly possible that both are F wave. And it's in fact even possible that both are S wave. But this is what I we think is the most likely scenario. So presence of flavor polarization and mu star, which we did not, so these are the interaction effect. Our theory right now doesn't include those important effects. Those important effects must be included. Uh, we have some idea how to do it, even including mu star. We can do the kind of, uh, kind of theoretical calculations. Uh, Phil Allen, you know, a pioneered in the, in the late, 70, uh, late 60s, early 70s for a regular lead and superconductors like that. My own feeling is mu star is small here. Uh, my guess is, you know, in all, all the metals, mu star is 0.2. My guess is mu star is more like 0 0.04 here. And, and I can answer questions why I think mu star is low, more like 0 0.04. If mu star is 0.2, then TC would be much, much lower. But these are open theoretical questions which we have to answer, okay, down the line, not in the first paper, but down the line. So this is a figure I, I borrowed from Andrea Young's talk today, actually from the preprint that he was really kind to send me. This is your superconducting one. This is superconducting two. I'll not talk about his superconducting three. And somewhere here, somewhere here is his, is his um, stoner phase ferromagnet. And as you see, superconductivity is very close to the stoner ferromagnet, but they don't overlap. If they overlap, I would have said that's an that's a F wave. Right now, uh, uh, you know, that's definitely phonon. But since it's close by, this could be paramagnon. But I find it very difficult to believe that this is phonon and this is paramagnon. So I'm going with both are phonon, you know. I'm going out on a limb and saying both are phonons. Although they could be both paramagnons. You know, they could be both paramagnons and MIT may also be paramagnon. Everything may be paramagnon. But paramagnon, we do not have a microscopic uh, estimate of the coupling. So TC is just a phenomenological parameter. Then TC is the coupling constant. And I don't like that. I, know, I, I, I like predicting TC. And here, at least for phonons, we have a prediction. So uh, actually, we calculated, it turns out, some years ago, 2011, 
the, the transfer properties, this is just acoustic phonon limiter transfer properties in ABC. We calculated for every single multilayer phonon one may someday do measurements. It's a very compact paper, with lots and lots of results, but it includes ABC phonon. So as you can see for ABC phonon, in this paper, we predicted that derodity should be roughly one ohm per Kelvin. It depends on density, density dependent. And you should see linearity, you know, at some temperature about 10 to 50 Kelvin, it depends on density. And these are some of the things experiments need to check uh, that, you know, if they are phonons, then there should be correlation between transport uh, in the linear regime and superconducting TC in the superconducting regime. And is the experimentalist job to sort these things out. They should not be identical, but they should be correlated. So let me conclude with this last figure where uh, Yang Zi applied an electric field, which basically changes this delta one parameter in the, in the theory. And then what you find is that uh, you can calculate TC in, in the different channels and how TC change and a calculated TC in D and P channels are basically zero. We, we don't find anything. There is basically no solution of the gap equation. And, and we also predicted how uh, the critical temperature should vary for the phonon model as you apply an electric field. So our, our paper that we are writing now, uh, uh, which should be posted in a couple of weeks for this phonon mechanism, we predict that, that uh, one should see this. And with that, I think I'm going to close. Thank you all very much for uh, you know sticking around for eight hours. It's not easy. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. You can also send me emails for questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Shankar, for this uh, wonderful talk. I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Maybe I can just make a quick comment. Um... Cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. I muted myself on a mistake. Uh, I want to make it clear that SC1 is observed in a spin and valley unpolarized, indeed, as you said, but SC2 is observed in a spin polarized normal state. Spin. On the bound, it's already spin polarized. Okay. You say by normal, you mean, what do you mean by normal here? I'm a bit confused. Uh, I mean that above the superconducting. Oh, okay. 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 By normal, you mean non everything is already spin polarized. Non superconducting. Very yeah. good point. And, you and, know, I already... and it's on the border of a, of a transition where another symmetry breaks, presumably something to do with the valleys, but it good. is itself in a spin polarized phase. Okay. So then, I mean, I covered all of these possibilities. Uh, uh, so I would then say there is a very high likelihood that your SC2 is a spin fluctuation which breaks the breaks the symmetry. It may be uh, is it, definitely then it's phonon induced because if it's ferromagnetic, if it's spin polarized, that means you don't have any spin fluctuation. You cannot have spin fermion coupling providing you superconductivity. And our calculation shows that if you have any spin polarization, then this SF degeneracy will be broken and F then becomes the ground state. So I'll make a stronger prediction now that your SC2 is most likely a phonon mediated F wave superconductor. Why not valley fluctuations? What's wrong with valley fluctuations? Oh, oh, oh I, of course, it could be, it could be, absolutely, it could be, I take back. I was not thinking, absolutely, it could be valley fluctuation mediated. Okay. All right. Absolutely. So, yeah, that, that was sort of our, our consider consider sure there's one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, because you know we can do a spin valley, uh, the va valley fermion model that will give us everything that I talked about spin fermion model. You are absolutely correct. So I I I I I, I stand corrected. What's the um, mechanism where mu star would be small, like 0.04? Is there some intuition there? I didn't get the question. Can you speak louder? What was your intuition for why the mu star would be small, like 0. Oh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so uh, there is almost a theorem uh, that mu star is 0. 0.2. Uh, and what that what I mean by that is every metal anybody has done calculation, mu star is 0. 0.2. So, all the people who are pros in band structure superconducting calculations, you can you can go and check the papers. Alan McDonald told me that. I asked Phil Allen. He told me that. So it's 0. 0.2. So in metals, mu star is 0.2. Let's just start from that premise, okay? So, but in metals, RS is more like six. 
in these systems, in these graphene systems, RS is more like 0.4. So since mu star is directly connected to Coulomb repulsion, it should be roughly factor of 10. So this is, this is the simple argument. This is the back of the envelope, zero order argument. Of course, this is not something I'm going to put in a paper, but I could kind of use this as an intuition. But this needs to be calculated. If mu star turns out to be one, well, you know, then you have a problem. Okay, uh, any other questions? Sankar, just yes. one question. Uh, just to make sure I understand fully, is there any circumstance under which in your calculations with phonons of TC, TC would be maximum at a minimum in the density of states? Yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to rephrase your question because I've thought a lot about it. What you are asking, Pablo, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the results that I showed you, still there is a strong correlation between calculated TC and the density of states. And is, right. it is it possible ever for that correlation to be kind of inverted, not just to be not there, not to be inverted? My honest answer would be that that if you find a finite TC at very low density of states and it's coming from phonons, I'll find it very difficult to see how it will disappear as you increase your density of states, okay? Unless, unless probably there is a strong caveat, unless mu star somehow is increasing with increasing density of states. So it may turn out that the fact that correlation effects are very strong in Moira system play a role in superconductivity after all. But the role is it tunes the phonon induced superconductivity and makes it disappear when the density of states large. Look, I'm making up a story, but I'm trying to answer your, answer your question honestly, okay? Sure. D did I answer your questions? You know, pure phonon, no. You, if you see STC at the density of states minimum, just with phonons, you should see a much higher TC at density of states maximum. That's the direct answer to your question. But there are other effects which may be circumventing it, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, it's not less uh, stronger again for this wonderful talk. And uh, I think that's uh, basically the end of uh, this uh, of this conference. And uh, Shankar, do you have anything to say about this presentation? Well, I mean, yeah, all, all I want to say is that I want to thank all 22 speakers, three times eight minus two is 22. Uh, we had three conferences, Meorana and Quantum and now Twisted. And I'm very grateful that all 24, uh, all 22 speakers when I asked them to give talks, they all agreed instantaneously within a day. So I never had to go to number two for any of the slots. And all of them prepared extremely uh, carefully. And I'm very grateful for, for that. They all gave you know, in-depth talks from which we learned a lot. And I believe that these talks online will be a very valuable asset for uh, the community, you know, which is what, all I wanted. And I thank all of you, uh, you know, profusely for giving talks and all of you for attending the talks because a speaker is useless if nobody's listening to the talk, right? So, you know, the, our average attendance for these eight, eight hour conferences have been more than 100, the average attendance, okay? Some of the attendance has reached 150, 160, but average attendance did not fall below 100. That's like a tremendous, and you know, of these 100, 25 are from Maryland, okay? Uh, I, I, I am really uh, uh, extremely uh, touched by it. This is all I can say. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, well, you, you should conclude the conference now, whoever is chairing the session. Okay, so uh, thank you all for uh, attending this talk and, and, uh, uh, and also thanks a lot for all the speakers to give the all the wonderful talks. And uh, I think I will stop recording. <laughs>